on the flip side, what's your take on El Salvador and their legal tender law? Um, I think it's really interesting. I mean, I, um, since I'm an attorney in the U S like I've been kind of following some of the States, you know, putting similar bills in place to become legal tender. Like in the U S it's a little funny to me because you know, that authority stand is held by Congress. Like no States could make something truly legal tender. They could make it use more usable in their state or, um, be benefited by the tax implications and things like that. But to become legal tender of the United States, you know, Congress would likely have to pass something. Um, but I think that we'll see more of that. And I, you know, I, I don't know enough about the El Salvador, like ecosystem or, um, financial system to know how much like value that's brought to them but it seemed like a really smart move and I think we'll see more of that and if you think about it like in the United States as states as individual states try to you know say oh we're going to adopt legal tender that's going to probably add some pressure to Congress and in the same way I don't even know how we could really make Bitcoin like a global legal tender but you know it, it all becomes about like the more people the more countries starting to go that direction. Um, and to me, like, I guess what's, what's really interesting to me is starting my career doing, you know, wholesale currency exchange is I saw the friction in that of like every country having their own currency um, and it being physical cash and you needing armored cars and dealing with transact, you know, uh, currency transaction exchange rates um, even just there in San Diego with, with the U.S. and the Mexico border touching. So I see a lot of value in, um, in Bitcoin being sort of a global currency. I think why it's so, why regulators seem so, you know, worried about it in the U.S. is for a long time, the U.S. has kind of ruled, the, ruled monetary policy, like the U.S. dollar has had so much value um, and so they are trying to hold on to that, but that's not, that won't always be the case. And the situation El Salvador has been in and other countries, um, you know, some countries have seen this crazy inflation in their currency where they can't, you know, they, I, I saw a picture of like a duffel bag to buy a sandwich, like a duffel bag of dollars to buy a sandwich. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's really interesting and it's all happening faster than I uh expected to be honest when it comes to bitcoin being a global currency i was thinking about yesterday and speaking with a friend about was like hey, trying to explain that to people trying to explain why and like why you'd want that in the first place to people who aren't into bitcoin or, or crypto um yeah. is quite difficult and i think like the best way i kind of came across of doing that was to say okay when you go abroad to other countries and you only speak english and you're in you know, somewhere in Africa where the guy doesn't speak English or you're in Japan or whatever, yeah. the language barrier is incredibly tough and it's a real pain to get over and you yeah. can't buy food potentially. You can't start a business. You can't do all these different things. And yeah. so the, the way to me is the same thing with currency is like the currency is doing the same thing, but, but instead we're kind of putting up these barriers unnecessarily. Exactly. Um, whereas with language, it's like a little bit more understandable how that has happened. With right. currency, it doesn't have to be that way, right? But then I guess at the same time, persuading people to use one currency globally is seemingly similar to persuading people to use one language globally, which is never going to happen. Right. And so I guess it's like, it's becoming a, a t as tough a task, but um, yeah. I think that's probably the best way to, to think of it. Yeah, I think so. I mean, the way I think or describe Bitcoin to someone who's sort of newer to this idea is that um, for some reason we've accepted now that like the, um, the friction that we maybe used to have in conversation, right? Like we didn't always have email. We didn't always have text messages, WhatsApp, whatever. Um, there used to be a ton of friction in getting messages around the world or even just to someone else in the United States. Um, and we've been, you know, the internet had some like pushback and issues and dealing with like encryption and privacy concerns and that sort of thing. But for the most part, I think the world like embraced removing some of the friction and barriers to communication um, through the internet and use of technology. And um, I don't, the fact that so many of us are just okay with there being so much friction in transferring funds uh, internationally, 
like cross-border remittance and the fees that you experience and the time delays, you know, like of a wire or ACH, all that friction can be removed by this technology. However, countries choose to adopt it. Like to me, it's just crazy. You can look at like a post office and think, wow, text message is way better for that. I'm not going to send them, you know, a mail to someone and put a, a stamp on it. And like, so it's funny to me that 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 doesn't sort of click right away with Bitcoin. And in part, I think, I think it takes people longer for it to click when they haven't maybe been the victim of that friction. You know what I mean? Like either they're, they still trust the government, they still trust the banks and they don't have to send money to family overseas or, or something, or, or they, you know, some people can't even get a bank account and Bitcoin on an on a smartphone has like given them new access to a financial system. So, um, you know, but at the same time, it's all baby steps. You can't like, you can't just force everyone in the world to understand the value of Bitcoin. Like I'm, it's my personal belief that if someone seems like closed minded to it or not interested in it, I never try to convince them like, no, you need to listen. You need to hear this. Look, they'll, they'll come back around when they're, when they're ready. I think. Yeah, that's the thing, right? It's like um, there's so many problems in the world where if someone's not ready to hear something, then it just is never going to work. So it's better, right. to, better way. Um, I agree with you there. I suppose um, something that I, I'm going to completely switch the conversation because otherwise I'm going to end up talking about this uh, for the entire rest of the podcast. Uh, something that uh, is interesting to me is, so obviously as you said, you you ended up in Silvergate Bank um, dealing with uh, crypto-related and financial crime-related stuff, uh, which seems pretty interesting uh, to me at least, yeah, and obviously totally. to you. Uh, so how how did you, I guess when it comes to that sort of story, like the next steps, you, you, you obviously were with Coinbase. Um, how did you end up getting to there? And like, what was that? Like, how did that opportunity come about? Like, what's the story yeah. behind that happening? Yeah, so... Um... So I was at Silvergate two years and honestly, I mean, Silvergate's still a very big banking player in the US, you know, cryptocurrency scene. And like those two years were, I really thought I'd probably stay there forever because it was just the coolest job to sort of have a bird's eye view of the whole ecosystem. And like, I was getting to see compliance programs and legal work product from like all the big exchanges and all these in gaming um, crypto in gaming type platform software developers. I mean, by the time I left Silvergate, I had reviewed like 80 of the biggest crypto companies in the US, like their, their entire sort of like internal workings. Um, but, uh, but Bitflyer, so Bitflyer is sort of like, I, I just call it the Coinbase of Japan. Um, I don't know now like what their market shares are, but they're sort of like for a long time have been the household name in Japan where new users often come to get into crypto. And so they were looking to expand into the US and um, it was a hard decision to join, but I felt like this would give me the ability to be really hands-on and actually go do some of the things I was seeing the exchanges were doing, like getting money transmitter licenses and the bit license and that sort of thing. Um, so it's sort of like, for me, I wanted to stay at Silvergate, but the opportunity was just too, too, um, too exciting personally. And so I was at um, Bitflyer for two years. We expanded. I was with like, I was in the first four founding members of Bitflyer US and help them get the bit license and like really built out their compliance and legal team. Um, and then I remember Brian Brooks joined Coinbase as their chief legal officer. Uh, and he has a really impressive background. And I remember I just reached out to him actually on LinkedIn and said, hey, Bitflyer is actually around the corner from Coinbase. Um, you know, congrats on the new role there. Would you want to grab coffee? And I didn't, you know, I was like, now, like my, I get so many email messages on LinkedIn and I never respond, you know, and I was like, I probably will never hear back, but I, you know, worth a shot. Um, and he wrote back pretty quickly and said, yeah, that would be great. And so we just started, I was really looking at him um, just as sort of like a mentor in this space because at Bitflyer, I, I had kind of was doing it all on my own. There was no more like senior attorney besides the outside law firms we worked with to like kind of learn from. So 
um, just kind of built a, a professional relationship with him. And then at one point, I remember him just saying something like, why aren't, why don't you work at Coinbase? And I was like, I don't know. I don't work at Coinbase. Um, I knew that it would be a, a kind of a different role for me because Coinbase is like a thousand employees. Whereas Bitflyer, we had grown to like 24 in the US, which is still a big jump from four to 24. But, um, you know, I was, uh, that opportunity came, but came about, I knew that I'd be able to like, potentially learn even more from Brian while I was there. Um, and so once again, I was kind of like, it's a really good opportunity. And I've, you know, kind of helped Bitflyer as much as I think I can after two years kind of built up, everything was sort of well, it was working as a well-oiled well machine. So I was like, I'll go see what Coinbase is up to. Um, and I knew that they'd be dealing with some really cool legal um, issues because they had at that time started listing a lot more tokens. Um, you know, I, I had read that they were like, a lot of companies were starting to look more into like lending and margin lending and that sort of thing. So I just knew that I was going to learn a lot. Um, and so, yeah, so that was sort of like how, how that move happened. And it was, I was there for a year. It was a great opportunity. Um, and, and I learned a ton. Speaking of lending, what's your opinion on this BlockFi $100 million fine to the SEC? Yeah, I mean, the SEC is definitely, in my opinion, like quickly becoming the most like hostile regulator we have in this space. Um, I mean, it was, I could, I could see it coming. I know there was like the ICO phase in 2017 and the SEC was getting kind of like, wait a second, if you're using a token to raise capital, that's fundraising, that's within our world. Um, but yeah, I think some of the things we're seeing right now with like, I mean, there was the Coinbase announced that they had approached the SEC to launch their crypto lending um, product. And the SEC said, if you do that, we'll sue you. Um, now there's been the settlement with BlockFi. Like, I mean, the amount of money that the settlement is, is not, I mean, not shocking. It's actually relatively small. Um, but I think that it's interesting just that I think the SEC tends to like regulate through enforcement and settlements and threats instead of sort of saying, okay, we get it. This is a new technology. It's not going anywhere. How can we regulate it so that the answer is not always no, you know? Um, so for me as an attorney, it's kind of frustrating because there's these companies that truly are trying to do things the right way. I mean, let's put aside like these companies that are just like scams or like want to pull the rug on people or like, you know, shit coins that don't actually do it, anything. They don't, there's no reason for a token to be involved. Um, but for these companies that like, you know, Coinbase, for example, had like 35 or 40 in-house attorneys, like they're, they're putting resources into doing things the right way and approaching the SEC is never easy, right? And so for the end result to just be like, no, we're going to sue you. It's like, that's just such an odd way to regulate the space. And for me, like, you know, I've always viewed the US as like wanting to promote innovation. So it's so strange to see when it comes to like cryptocurrency innovation that, that it's a pretty difficult uh, climate for companies in the space. Yeah, that's something that I find um, interesting and I guess worrisome. I mean, obviously me not as a non-US citizen, I think I've visited New York once and that's about as far as I've gone when it comes to the US. But we're all yeah. aware that, you know, the US is a big player internationally and and it's good to see free growth and, and things like that. And I think that one thing that kind of uh, I found, that I think I'd find really frustrating is that a lot of these companies have probably looked to the to the SEC for guidance in the past or have tr and seemingly a lot a lot of them have tried to do the right thing generally it appears in a, in a, in an area where the SEC has been silent i suppose uh, for a long time and hasn't given yeah. any real guidance so then to then I, I would be incredibly frustrated as a business owner if i then got you know slammed with a 100 million dollar yeah. Um, yeah, I've like, well, <laughs> it kind of, it's like the, the basic fairness is kind of like, if, I, if there aren't any rules and I've tried my best to make some fair ones up to follow because you never gave me any, yeah. it seems odd to me to then just kind of punish 
that behavior like what feels like honest behavior um i mean coinbase coinbase is a good example of that and like i'll kind of give a little overview and all of this is public information it's not based on anything i know from my time as regulatory counsel there but like coinbase you know and other exchanges have wanted to list tokens and they've put forth pretty rigorous reviews to figure out okay, we don't think that this token is a security. We feel safe listing it. Um, Coinbase, along with a bunch of other exchanges, created the Crypto Rating Council, which is more like a group effort to review crypt tokens and decide if they are a security or not. Coinbase also went and got a broker, acquired a broker dealer and an ATS. And, um, and then, you know, as far as I've been able to tell, the SEC has not said, okay, that can be operational and apply to Coinbase's business. And even if it could, what a broker dealer can do is list um, registered securities. None of these tokens are registered securities because the idea is that they're maybe not securities. So there, there's like this catch 22 where really there's no way for an exchange to eliminate the SEC risk if they want to list anything besides like Bitcoin and maybe I have, I have like sort of an, like, I'm not sure about Ethereum to be honest, but arguably Bitcoin and Ethereum are not securities and everything else is sort of up for debate and it's a fact intensive uh, debate. So, um, so yeah, I think it's very frustrating for exchanges and companies in general in the space. I mean, as an attorney, you, my clients are people who are willing to pay money um, and engage with a law firm to do it the right way. But there's certain aspects of regulation in the US that you can't limit, you can't get it to zero risk for them. You just can't, right? Like, and until the regulator gives more guidance or changes the way they approach the space. With, with the regulatory uh, clarity being so murky, what kind of trends are you seeing from like uh, crypto startups, like in terms of what kind of like legal services they're seeking from you? I mean, I think what's frustrating is sometimes um, clients or, or companies in general are wanting guidance on how to avoid the U.S. Um, so, you know, you see that and you realize that the product that they're developing just won't even come to the U.S. because that's safer. Um, you know, I, as an attorney, we have to be really careful because the SEC has actually said that attorneys and other professionals are kind of like gatekeepers for their regulation. So um, my firm takes a very conservative approach where we wouldn't write something, we wouldn't have like a token client and give them a document that says your token's not a security, you're good to go the way you've done it. But what we do is we work with, you know, um, exchanges and, and projects and protocols to say it would be better if you steer the project this way or don't do, don't do that, don't have a pre-mine or don't have the founding team keep a bunch of tokens or, um, you know, just sort of efforts and like that. So um, some, of our, some of the work we do in the space is just trying to make, to mitigate the risk um, that a company will face with the SEC.